So last week we looked at predestination. But not predestination on its own merits. It is in relationship to the decree of God. That God, by his decree, that is paragraph three and four, by his decree, and that is by his decree and for the manifestation of his glory, predestined some men and angels and has foreordained them to eternal life. And that ordination, that for, excuse me, that for ordination is through Jesus Christ. And it, it is to the praise of his glorious grace. What that means is that from the, from the mass, from the lots of fallen creatures, the Lord, God, foreordained that some will be elected through Christ for salvation by grace. So those human beings who got saved from the population of sinful fallen men have received grace and mercy from the hand of a just God. And the confession says the rest of the humanity, the Lord passed them by. The Lord God, the way he worked faith actively in the hearts of the elect, is not working actively in the heart of unbelievers by working in unbelieving, unbelief in their heart. They are sinful by nature, they are unbelieving by nature, this is who they are. By God's sovereign choice, he bypassed them. He refused to do anything in their case. So in the final analysis, those whom God refused to act upon, if they found themselves in hell, what they are receiving is called justice. They are receiving what they rightly deserve. We that are saved are receiving mercy. We both deserve hell. Out of God's free choice, he saved some of us, also men and angels. And out of his own justice, he bypassed some persons. That is it. And the confession made it more clear that the numbers of those who God elected are certain from the point of God, in the mind of God, with God. Those, those numbers of the elect are certain. It cannot be increased or diminished. And those who are damned, their numbers are also certain. It cannot be increased or diminished. What the confession is saying is that those whom God will have in heaven on the last day, he knows the numbers. Not just by way of knowing, that's okay, there will be 100. Like, God is not working by projection. It's okay, plus or minus, out of Trinity, we can get 10. Plus or minus from, from, from Redeem, we can get 2, 5. Plus or minus from Ethiopia, we can get 10. America. So, so angels are have, there's a, they, they have a, a kind of a, a situation room where they are working figures. They are night with laptops. And, uh, the angels have laptops in heaven. I don't know. They are working. And then they are doing permutations. And then during the great awakening, the number just increased. And they're doing our own time now. And the number has actually <laughs> dropped. And then they are working on contingents. Okay. Uh, what do we do now? We have more than enough estates. I mean, how are you going to fill them up? It's okay. Uh, reduce the cutoff mark. So that's the uh, quota system. Okay, children that are born to pastors' family should have more advantage. Children that are born to other things' family, they are not pastors, so let them have, uh, let them increase their, their cutoff mark, 300. That's not what is happening. As far as God is concerned, it is from our own point that this world looks so big that times look so massive. As far as God is concerned, all these things we are calculating are in his palm. It's like, 
if, if, if I used to go to the farm, and there are all these small, small ants. Have you ever seen ant running before? Yes, ant is speeding at one million per, uh, kilometer per hour. You are just looking at the ants. If you put an ant here, now the kind of speed, the ant is speeding from here, sweating to this place. You are still standing. The ant is just running. And all you do is like this. That's it. That's how God acts. All that the ants are doing, you, you know. But for them, do you see when ants are walking? They are so busy carrying heavy, heavy load. You could see ants carrying heavy load like this, and they, are, and they think they are busy. The farmer is just looking at them. If the farmer wants to use that anti heat for something, they just, just scatter everything. Even the birds that nest around our houses, see how they work hard there? They, they look so serious. Something that you can just use one of your hands, just even broom, and that will be it. That's how God. This is just a, 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 a faulty an analogy. When we're talking about God, when we're talking about God, it's just like all this thing we are just calculating. The entire Nigeria, how big, you know, the, today fuel, the, there's an official fuel increase today in Nigeria. So any fuel going to the northeast is increased by 24 naira. Fuel going to Lagos increased by 4 naira. Abuja increased by 14 naira. You know, they are just doing this because Nigeria is too large. Samisa forest is too big. Entire night, all Africa, all the continents, the, they are just like this. And I, I think Isaiah has said that, he, he said, human beings are counted for nothing as far as God is concerned. They are like a drop of water. Okay. Let's get to this study today. Paragraph five. Those of mankind that are pre predestinated to life, God, before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, had chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his mere free grace and love, without any other thing in the creature as a condition or cause, moving him thereunto. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Quickly, move the microphones around. If I see it, I read. If you see it first, you read. Romans 8, verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. Yeah. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Yeah, then uh, verse 9, uh, chapter 9, sorry, verse, uh, verse 9, yeah. Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Yeah. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Second Timothy, who saved us? Second Timothy 1 verse 9, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So what paragraph 5 is saying, there are other scriptures, okay? What paragraph is saying is that, When God chooses people, that, that action is not resting on conditions external to God, 
God is not looking at Brown and say, ah, that's a good guy there. You should have him in heaven. I mean, if giving it, if, as a pastor, giving, there are some persons, I don't want to have them in my church if they are schismatics. And there are some, if, if, there's, if it's within my power, I'm going to say, go to Abuja and select 100 people to pastor, and it is me selecting. You know what I would do? Where do you think I, sh- I will go and select people? Where do you think as a pastor I will go to select people if God gives me a hand to go and select Christians and bring them to church? I'll go to national assemblies to start from there. I'll run around in Tama, Asokoro, all those areas, and then CBN, NMPC. Yeah, NMPC, yes. Select them. Then military guys. Because there's something I've seen in them there could be added advantage. If I, I will go to theological school and put together clever theologians who are thinking like me, who will not give me trouble. But when God made his choice, that choice flows out of what we call the secret, the secret counsel of God. And it's in that place. But the land that was secret cancer, we don't know. So you will never know why God chose you. That why belongs to God. It can never be on the basis of what you have done. Or there's something, there's a particular trait and character that God saw in you. That, that's okay, I will act based on that information. Are we clear up to this point? Paragraph 6. He said, As God had appointed the elect unto glory, so he hath, by the eternal and most free purpose of his will, for ordain all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. And he said, neither are any other redeemed by Christ or effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Anyone there? Yeah. Okay. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse thirteen. For we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Great. First Peter chapter one verse two. First Peter chapter one verse two. Hebrews James Peter. First Peter chapter one verse two. The foreknowledge of God the Father mm-hmm. in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be, be multiplied multiply. to you. Okay, that is the first principle you will learn from paragraph six that God foreordained and chose the means 
thereunto. And what it means? Hmm? What is the means? I, I, I just bring your head back here. Hmm? I mean, I'm, I'm so calmed. Am I speaking beyond your, your head? So your silence means either you are confused or... Okay, let's read more scriptures, then I'll, I'll make, make some comments. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. Five verse nine to ten Thessalonians. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are weak or asleep, we might live with him. Yeah. Titus chapter two verse fourteen. From all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Okay. Romans 8, verse 30. I think we read it earlier. Okay. Do you need to read it again? Yeah, Romans 8, 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And finally, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse thirteen. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you yeah. as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Yeah. Now, now give me your attention now. God from all eternity had purposed in himself to do something. And the reason and the purpose for that choice to elect people is best known to him. And speaking the language you can understand now, is best known to him. And because he is God, he has that prerogative to have that latitude of action. That is cast in iron. You can't change that. Uh, in his mind, he is redeeming people from all walks of life to salvation. The second point that the confession wants us to learn this night is that as God has appointed the elect to glory, he has, by his own free purpose of his will, for then all the means thereunto. So the first principle is that the elect, the means by which God will bring them to glory is that they must be redeemed in who? In Christ. All the elect from Adam to the last human being on earth, are redeemed by Christ. And that is the first thing. Secondly, it does not end there. 
They are redeemed by Christ. So what that means is that when Christ was dying on the cross, believers, are, the elect, are factored into in him that he, when he went on the cross, all the elects are factored in that work. When he went down to the grave, all the elect went down to the grave with him. He, he, he carried them along spiritually as their representative. And then when he rose from the grave, we were raised together with him. So before you even understand, before you come to the knowledge of your salvation, if you are the elect, you have been redeemed already. It is on the basis of that reality that the Holy Spirit comes after you. And the first thing that happens when the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart is that you are effectually called. And that happens by preaching, primarily, normatively. So effectual calling is that you hear God speaking by preaching or by preaching either from the pulpit or with tracks, and then there's an instigation, there's a quickening in your heart. And then by faith, you reach out to Christ. And that faith also is the gift, is the package that comes by the work of the Holy Spirit. So you see, by the Spirit, all this is about the Spirit working in due season. And then as the Spirit is working, all this is happening, not, 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 not like... Uh, in, in, not like uh, in a logical order, but not, not in, a, in a chronological order, but in a logical order, as it's happening, you are justified. So it's not something like, yeah, God has elected me from eternity, then I'm elected. There are, there are something's happening down below the earth. The death of Christ was necessary for that to happen. The Holy Spirit working in your heart giving you the gift of faith and you reaching out to Christ by the conviction of sin that happened in your heart are all necessary, happening. And then you are justified. Justification means God in the court of heaven make a declaration over you that this one, even though guilty, is not guilty. The work of my son is applied to his account. He is being reckoned as righteous. The righteousness of Christ is being given to his account. And, and then, this happened in the court of heaven. You don't even know. You are not even aware. You are still in the beer parlor when all these things are happening. And the moment that happened, the moment that declaration happened in the court of heaven, adoption takes place. You are adopted into uh, the family of God. You are no longer a bastard. You're now a child of God. And then, that's how, that's, these are the sequences. And then sanctification takes place. And sanctification are in two parts. One is the positional sanctification. At that point, you are cut from the world. You are removed. You are separated. The word sancti sanctification means separation, isn't it? You are, you, are, you are made holy at that point to God. You are set apart for God and there's a mark on your forehead that says, this is holy. This is, this is no longer, uh, this is not, uh, uh, no longer uh, of the devil. This is mine. And then there's a what I call progressive sanctification. And then continually, the Holy Spirit now indwelling you, continue to work uh, in you. And then by mortification of, uh, of sin. That is not the end. You're also kept. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And the confession ends by saying, there is no other person who will enjoy these things except those who are redeemed in Christ. You cannot abstract this benefit to an unbeliever. An unbeliever is not justified. You cannot be justified, then you are not adopted. You know, when you are part of, over the years, the Christian church has become so confused. They make it look like, Christ died for me, he has redeemed me. 
but I'm yet to be justified. Or it's like saying, uh, I have been justified now, I'm a Christian, but I'm, yet, I'm, yet, I'm not yet being born again. I'm not yet being given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's like somebody who is a Christian now is still a bastard. The adoption has not yet uh, taken place. Maybe it took 20 years before adoption. Uh, no. The moment your name eternally is in the book of life of God, Christ died for you, and you were part of that process spiritually. And the moment that is true of you, uh, inevitably, saving faith will be given to you. And then justification will happen. The moment a man or a woman is justified, adopt, it's like, well, I don't know if you've been to the court of law before. Raise your hand if you've been to the court, high court, magistrate court. Now, if you stand by the court and then the judge made a pronouncement and says, Mr. Lagbaja is guilty, is guilty on all the counts and is to spend 45 years in prison. And then he will drop the, is, that, is it gavel? Bam. What happened after that? Would the judge now ask the, the warder to take him away? Would the judge ask the, law, the warders, the, the prison people to take him away? What happened? Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. Even if you have been enjoying your bail, you came to the courts free with your two hands in your pocket. The moment the judge said, guilty. All of a sudden, all the agencies that are responsible for your punishment, just <laughs> they'll be like a mushroom, they'll just stand up. And then they, they'll begin to arrange you. The transporters that will transport from here to Kujie prison will be on hand. The person that will put you in handcuffs, everybody, back, 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 back. and then once you reach Kujie prison, their own job finished, and they open the door. Those guys from inside prison arrange you inside. Back, 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 they'll start shaving your head, you know, shaving your hair. And by tomorrow morning, you are with a uniform. The judge is not ordering all these things anymore. Once, he, once guilty is pronounced, all departments that you take out of your punishment to the hangman will be activated. So also with the Christian, except you are a false professor, the moment is true of you that certain faith is present. Every other benefit of Christ will be activated on your account. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't have to start beginning to procure, procure uh, adoption. And then after adoption, you are now looking for sanctification. No? And then you are looking for sanctification. You secure that one. And then the preservation also becomes another big uh, uh, issue. And then you have to start paying your tithe to be preserved. Tithe of preservation. You have to do praise and worship for you to be preserved. And then as a Christian, I just run around, run around, run around. Even your pastor is even bullying you that if you don't know some certain things, he can withhold something from you. I mean, Roman Catholic Church, that's what they're saying. They say without the church, there's no salvation. Outside the church, there's no salvation, says Roman Catholic Church, meaning the Pope hold the keys. If you don't go to confessions, they hold you by the trouser. No, free. There's this hymn we sing, free from the law. Oh, a happy condition. Happy co condition. No more payments to be made. And paragraph seven is more of like an application. So any question to this point before I read paragraph seven? Okay. Paragraph seven. He said, the doctrine of this, of the high mystery. Now, look at our forefathers, how clever they are. They call it mystery. Hmm? They are still reiterating the fact that these things are high. That normal human comprehension is, uh, is, is sufficient to handle it. Because God is incomprehensible. He said, this high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care that men attending the will of God, revealing his word, and yielding obedience thereunto may, from the certainty 
of their effectual vocation be assured of their eternal election. So shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. Maybe just read some of the few passages there, then I'll make a quick uh, final comment. Deuteronomy chapter 29, 29, Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. I think you can. What is, is the memory verse? None of you know Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things. Romans 9, verse 20. Romans 9, verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What is molded? Say to it, molder. Mm-hmm. Why have you made me like this? Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom oh, the, yeah. mm-hmm. and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. Yeah. And how inscrutable his ways. I swear. Amen. No. This doctrine of predestination. Ha. If you go to my library, you see, bo- you see books and books upon books. It's that like this is a playground for heretics. The doctrine of predestination and election is a playground for unserious people. See? Why should God elect some people and will not elect some other people? Sure, seriously. And then people will write. They will write. I'll be reading Augustine on this thing. Both Augustine, and that's actually the issue with Pelagius. The idea of human autonomy, the idea that God cannot. I mean, I put a video on our WhatsApp group recently about one of the popular pastor in Nigeria. I say, he said, God is sovereign. He said, but God is not in control of the earth. That God has ceded his sovereignty to men. And some persons will say, oh, wow, what a death. What a mystery. So God ceded sovereignty. The first thing that that pastor lacked was that he he doesn't even know the the working definition of sovereignty. So we should be careful with this doctrine. Both on both sides. If you don't understand, keep quiet. If you understand, be careful. So that predestination and election should not be something just I'm elect. You know, we that are elected, you know. We that are the elect. In fact, there are some churches or some Christian groupings that call themselves the elect. They call themselves the elect. There's another church that I knew around here that called themselves the remnants. So you, you, <laughs> careful. Because this idea of elect, eh, there's, there's no tattoo here that shows, okay, these are the elect. Their ears are always long. Oh, elect are always fair. They have pointed nose. No. We don't know. We don't know. But the reason why we are preaching and teaching this doctrine and why it is necessary to the life of the church and to you, the confession is giving it now. It said, you need assurance. Following God is not a 50-50 thing. We are following God. God has saved you. All the investment of your redemption that I've mentioned before cannot be true of you and you will not know. You cannot be saved and not knowing. And if you know that you have been saved, one irreducible minimum is that you will know that your salvation is not by your power. If you think that it is God cooperating with you, 
that God saw some qualities in you and God did some 70% and you did supply the 30%, you are likely not to be saved. So if you have been saved, you should know. And the word of God and the confession want you to have assurance so that you will not be tossed to and fro by the wind of every doctrine. That's the first principle. If people say, ah, this issue of predestination election, now they put food on my uh, uh, table, how does that save me? Is that the gospel? Yeah, of course. Augustine believed that predestination, but even Calvin, that election and predestination is at the heart of the gospel. You can't preach the gospel without these as components. If everything revolves around this, if God had not elected anyone before the foundation of the world, before the fall, no one would be saved. Christ would have come. The basis for the appearance of Messiah is that there are some men and women that God had given to him before the foundation of the world called the elect. And for their sake, he laid down his life. He called them my sheep. So redemption, atoning work on the cross, rests on the possibility or the reality of election. And the, the Bible wants to be assured. I am in Christ. Secondly, this assurance should not make you like a proud person. Can you watch the Oh, I'm assured, I have assurance. I'm elected. No. He said he should afford the matter of praise. That as a believer, you should be filled with praise. Having learned of all of this thing, that God had you even before this world was formed. And for your sake, he sent his son to die. You cause for praise and not pride. Number two, it you cause for reverence. What that means is that reverence means you are, you, 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 there is this fearful awe that must accord your life now as a Christian, meaning that in this life, in this your life, God is the one holding the yam and the knife. So it's not that you, it's not 50 50. You can't, you, you can't make any, you don't have any contribution here. Salvation is of the Lord from the beginning to the end. You must fear God because God has the prerogative to do whatever he will do with you. You should revere him who does all these things. Who could save a non-entity like you and then look, look at one honorable and bypass him and withhold from him saving faith and restraint, reverence. Number four, the issue of admiration of God. A believer should wake up every day and say, what a, what a God thou art. It causes you to admire God, all his work. Number five, it calls for humility. And Paul was quite clear about boasting. He said, if salvation is by grace, where is the boasting? It's not by works. You cannot. Sometimes people will tell us that they are super Christians. And the reason why they are super Christians is that for the past 20 years, they have not done anything. And that's not what I'm talking about. They have not done anything. They have not, they have not done anything. If there's any one of you here that have lived your Christian life very consistently over the years, who, who, who owns the credit? God. Humility. And then he also called for diligence. Because all the scripture we've read tells us that we have been called to work, to good works. To good work. Philippians said, work out your salvation 
with fear and trembling. For it is God that works in you. We have been saved, Ephesians, we have been saved unto good works. And there's diligence. That's, uh, uh, they say, to whom much is given, much is required. God, the entire heaven eyes are on you. Your neighbor, that's not a Christian, has been bypassed. Let me give you a, a normal example. If you, when you were in secondary school, some of us were functional in the FCS. Look at what other boys are doing and nobody talk. If we do small, what would they say? They say, ah, you are the pastor picking. You, where they go to FCS? Where do they allow us rest for night? Now you, the reason is that both Satan and the entire angel of God and God himself, have, have, their eyes are on you. You are God's investment. You are like an NPC. Everything, this God, any NPC is a golden egg. You are the golden egg. You are the apple of God's eye. Apple, you are the apples of God's eye. And God is focused on you. It calls for diligence. You have responsibility now. You are an ambassador of heaven. You are a child of God. You live in this world. You are no longer of this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. It calls for diligence. But this doctrine of election has caused many people to make shipwreck of their faith. Those who are uh, 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 I have not saved initially. Yes, uh, if God has elected me, and the community say uh, the number cannot be increased, the number cannot be reduced, <laughs> so I'm in the basket. I'm in the basket. The number cannot be reduced, the number cannot be increased. I, I don't know if you understand this thing. A sinful man with this, ah, praise I, this, this church good though. Today, I ran through uh, a video that some, someone said that Christ has already paid that God will not put you into hell because of sin. A pastor preaching that as far as sin is concerned, God can no longer put anybody into hell because of sin. Christ has paid. Say, well, hell now is because you refuse to accept Christ. Okay, that, that, that is not sin. <laughs> Even that alone is sin. So it's called for diligence. You should not be like, oh, thank God I'm elected. I'm already in the basket. Oh, once saved, always saved. Let's go on now and do what we want. It shows that you have not been saved initially. And the verse 7 talks about consolation. And it talks about obedience to the gospel. If I'm elected, I obey the commandment of God. I'm a child of God. Joy. Assurance. Anytime we lack assurance, it could be that we are sinning against God or we, are not, we have not been saved. Have assurance, joy, praise, reverence, admiration of God, humility, diligence, abundant consolation. That even things are not working for me on earth, I have a home in heaven. If my body is wasting away, I have a tabernacle with God that's not made with the hands. I have eternal assurance. I have consolation. I am not a loser. Or the, or I'm not a loser. I'm not a loser. Whether I'm educated or I'm not educated, I'm not a loser. I have Christ in me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. If God had predestined me, he called me, he justified me, he will glorify me. And Romans said, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Saved in the hand of God. Secured in the hand of God. He will not let go. All that my father had given me are in my hand. And this is the gospel. And because of these things, we will obey God. We will enjoy obeying God. We are his children. So when we say, the son of a lion is a lion. The son of a lion is a lion. Sometimes they say it in the context whereby the son of a lion is a lion that is, is by a roaring. 
Ah, we take dominion here. Ah, no. Some of the lions are lions. There's they, this single marker for Christ. And I've repeated this again and again. This is from John Murray. John Murray, yes. What is the marker of Christ? Obedience. The entire work of Christ can be sung into one thing, obedience. And what was the follow, What was the issue with Adam? One thing, disobedience. So the son of a lion is like a lion. True. Let our lives be shown. Let our lives be shown in obedience. By this, all men will know that are my disciples. If you love one another, and if you love me, you will keep my commandment. Questions and contribution. Now, beautifully, they, we are still going to look at uh, is is there we have they are on their own merit. We've mentioned this election, this nation in the context of God's decree. Okay, as a subject on its own, we are still going there. Election, predestination, adoption, sanctification, what they all are. We are going to look at them in the confessions in the, as we go in, the, in coming weeks. But we have mentioned predestination and election in light of God's decree. Any quarrel, any fights, any question, any, both online and offline. Um, Brother Samuel Eju is asking, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. For small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Does this text suggest that man has a role in his salvation? In his salvation, please shed some light. Who wants to respond to that? I will want to respond because if you don't respond to this question, it means you've not been, you don't you don't you've not understood everything you've been saying. Matthew seven was eh, thirteen years. For some of you that want to look at it again before you answer. So this section of the scripture that you guys are doing, what is happening? This particular passage now doesn't mean that man has a role in his salvation. That God provided a gate. It's up to you to walk through it. How will you respond to that, Felix? Give him a microphone. I, I, th- I, I see it as the same way um, fallen man, man is um, commanded to obey the law. Yeah. Just so it is, it's actually pointing to the fact that no man can actually do that. And that even that road, when it is being told, it's, it's just describing the life of those who eventually do that. But it's not suggesting or giving any um, specific um, idea about the fact that it is man who finally or eventually by himself yeah. walks through the narrow gate. Yeah. So, I mean, we we'll go through our scripture, there's always the command of do this, obey this, do yeah. this, obey this. So I see it in that same kind of category that it is the road to, to, um, to follow God is narrow, it is 
um, a life of self-denial and all that. So it is talking about the life after the initial work of God, mm. not the life that, um, that begins or not the initial, I don't know how to put that, but basically without being repetitive and all, but basically I believe it is just the command that can be applied to even when we are commanded to obey. Every creation of, of the whole world is commanded to obey the law of God. But how is that possible? The scripture or that particular text did not um, expound on that. It was only saying this is what it implies to follow God or to find God or to um, be a follower of Christ. Okay. Yes. Uh, if, uh, Obong, take the microphone. That's Mr. Brown, the voice you are hearing. Yeah. All right. I think to build on what uh, Brother Felix just said, um, the fact that we do not know how we can enter that narrow gate can, can, can push us in submission. Because like you said, the law was a pointer to the fallen nature of man in the sense that no matter what man would do, he cannot meet up to the expectations of the law. The law was not given to tell man that he can obey it if he does this and such thing. So I think that um, ent telling us to enter by the narrow gate and we realize this is not something that we can do or okay. we can, we can uh, um, enter in and of ourselves. It pushes us in humility to, to run to God, yeah. Yeah. Ima? Yeah, so verse 13 says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. Use the mic so that they can hear you from. This leads to destruction, and those who entered are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard and leads to life, and those who find it are few. So there is in the context of the passage, there are two things. There's finding and then there's entering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of salvation, um, we see even from scripture that we are justified and we are sanctified as well. So, um, for those who are justified, are done so um, they, no one can be justified unless God justifies them. So no one can find this narrow gate itself without um, God doing the work actively on that person's life. And when we are justified, we, need, we have to be sanctified. We have to go on in our continuous work in the faith. And, well, um, it's a bad analogy I used, but if you are sanctified, you... Ima, you I don't understand where you are going. I'm still struggling. Say there's a, there's a finding and there's an entering. That's what I've heard. Yes, uh, Brother Eliezer. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I could, I could come up with another scripture uh, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye who are um, burdened and you are heavy laden. And... Um, I could say, does that mean human beings can come by themselves? Or even Isaiah, come, let us reason together. So there are a lot of passages of scripture that seem to point, that is, it, is, it seems to suggest, well, if you look at it at face value, that God is saying, do what you can do. But then, I believe what we find in Matthew 7 is what we call a general gospel call. This is what Jesus does in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, where he's, verse 15, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, they asked, what shall we do? And the response of Peter was not, you cannot save yourself. The, it was a general call of the gospel. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is the way we see preaching being done throughout the book of Acts. So Jesus is saying, enter into the narrow gates. It's like saying, 
Turn from your sins. Turn from your evil ways, which is the command of the prophets and the way the call of the gospel usually goes forth. So it's, it's, it doesn't negate the fact that God is the one who will make man turn. Mm-hmm. But the free offer of the gospel comes with this, repent and believe. That's how the gospel always comes to unbelievers. It is the Holy Spirit who now works in them to enable repentance and belief. But I don't know how we want to preach the gospel except by telling sinners to stop sinning and turn to Christ. Yeah. Come to Christ, come to the cross, fall down at the feet of Christ and ask him to save you. Yeah. By so saying you that go, we're not it, saying he can do it. Yeah, you don't go and preach the gospel and say, hello, people of Abuja. Jesus died for the elect. And if you are the elect in this crowd, move to this side. Non-elect, there's no point. And then you now face the elect. Is that what happened in the gospel presentation? In the gospel proclamation, it is to all. Uh, in this confession, in this uh, manual we are using, we are going to come to uh, a chapter on effectual calling. Okay? There is a distinction between the general call of the gospel and the effectual calling. Of the gospel, that general call to all. When I'm preaching the gospel, I don't know who are the elect. I'm going to urge them to run from the wrath of God to come. I'm going to urge them to believe. And it's all about the scripture believe, repent, come to Christ, come to Christ. This is the call, it goes to everybody. But it is effective and effectual only in the heart of the elect. So two persons hear this passage. One mocks and goes away. One repent and turn to Christ. The few that find that thing, that's what the, the gospel is expanding going forward. John 6, 44. Jesus said, No one can come to me except unless my father who sent me draws him. So the one that here follow the narrow gate is the father who will eventually draw him, ultimately draw him to that uh, reality. It's not something he will do on, on his own. It is the Holy Spirit working. Roman, uh, Ephesians 2, we're dead in sin and trespasses. A dead man cannot start up talking for gates. I say, Let me, where, where, is the, where, where is the gate? No. It is when you've been quickened, and then you, ask, you, you, you respond to this. Uh, the second part, I think I like the way Felix trying to explain it. This is the general call. You can also extrapolate from this passage the, the content of discipleship. Because chapter 7 is in the context of chapter 5. The sermon on the, on the mount. They talk about divorce, vows. All those things, if I don't divorce my wife, that, that doesn't mean I'll be saved. I'm not contributing to my salvation because I'm, I'm, I'm keeping to my vows and all the commandments that Christ was teaching on the mount here. Yeah. It's that when after you the following Christ, it's a narrow road actually. There is there is there is there is, there is uh, an urging of Christians to take to be diligent with their Christian life, just as we read in the in the confessions. That the doctrine of predestination calls for diligence. It calls for carefulness to walk on a narrow path. Because now that I've been saved, God is showing you what it takes and what, that, what, that, what, what, what it will require for you to be a discipleship. It's, it's, it means we are going to forsake the world. We are going to stop loving the world. We are going to say no to yourself and to your desires and to the desires and the demands of this world. These are narrow roads. And the classical book that will help you is The Pilgrim's Progress. Okay, I will recommend that either in the movie or the book, any day. Yeah. You know, when, when the guy just realized uh, that he has been in the city of uh, whatever, you know, the early journey was so fast. And then before you know, bam, 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 that kind of a thing. Yeah. So I made you, I'm not sure if you, have you been helped? Many things. Okay. You owe me a loaf of bread, you know. Bread is going to be expensive now.
I heard that uh, they want to increase the price of bread. So <laughs> we'll be taking offering in bread now. Yeah? <laughs> uh, but we praise God for life. I thank God for the doctrine of salvation, the teaching of, the, of salvation, and the one we've learned tonight. About seven things that this, why this doctrine of predestination, why we are teaching it about seven things. Remind me, one, the first thing is assurance. Assurance. Number two, praise. Number three, reverence. Number four, admiration of God. Number five, humility. Number six, diligence. Number seven, consolation. And then you throw the eighth there, obedience. This is not for it's not meant to debate why God, why should God, if I, why was sin in the first place? Some people are so crazy to, to even say God to put why on God. And thank God for Paul. He say, Who are you? Romans 9, say, Who are you? To ask God why. If not for the graciousness of God, the day you open this your Nigerian mouth and say, why? You should just drop dead. Thunder, you just fire you. For saying, God is sovereign only in heaven. He's not sovereign on earth. You shouldn't be walking the following day. Thank God I'm not God. Praise God for his forbearance. Father, we thank you for tonight. This is just a scratch on the surface of things that we can know about you and about the depth and mystery of our salvation. Lord, grant that this little revelation that you've given to us may suffice for our work with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.